so welcome to the post lunch session of day 2 of the indica conference on hindu arts architecture and artisan traditions uh, we start off with something very very inter uh, interesting a question and answer session with uh, christian devietri who brings a very different and very fresh perspective to the table but let me introduce uh, you to christian before we start the q and a Christian Devietri is an Australian born artist with a masters in fine arts with uh, from Columbia University. He has also studied in Paris, he has also studied in Australia in he has degrees in contemporary art and he has also had traditional training in the ancient lineage of uh, Indian sthapatis with none other than Dr. V Ganapati Sthapati himself. His sculptures have been collected and commissioned internationally for the past over 20 years. and he's been the recipient of several awards including citizen of the year for his contribution to visual art in australia he is known for large installations as well as very beautiful indian style murtis that he has created and all of his concepts are refreshingly different uh, a very warm welcome to you christian and uh, it's a great pleasure to talk to you so let me start by the most obvious question which i'm sure many people would have probably asked you uh, the question is you are an artist with uh, you know a great pedigree in contemporary western art education you studied in australia you studied in paris you studied in us you are very familiar with the paradigms of western contemporary art but what prompted you to explore traditional sthapati traditions of india which idiomatically are very very different from the way the west perceives art Uh, it's a wonderful question uh, shishi fali uh, and thank you again for inviting me to this conference um so uh, yeah this exploration began really in earnest about 10 years ago um i had recently graduated from columbia university uh, from the mfa program there and i was working in the contemporary art world uh in um in new york um but deep down you know i i had a sense of not being completely fulfilled and i had a sense that there must be something more to to life <laughs> and also uh, a sense that there must be something more than the continental philosophy which had been the foundation of my western art uh, education so it was around this time uh, that i i began to um practice yoga and meditation um and a process of deep transformation <laughs> began to occur it was uh, like a deep reorganizing force uh that took hold uh, around that time and it reoriented the the course of uh my life um towards uh i could say an embodied realization of truth so instead of searching externally for meaning um <laughs> uh in in my life which i'd really been doing up until that point i i turned within um and you know what drew me to the indian tradition uh specifically is not only that there is an exceptionally clear articulation of the nature of reality but there is also and also the purpose of human life but there's also a, a, a there's a methodology for attaining it and um so you know i became a practitioner um and so i began to engage with the indian tradition from this perspective uh, i should say and i i i also as i as i as i went along this path i began to wonder what role does art play in the process of liberation um in this process of union which is the goal uh, of yoga and so i inevitably came across the the deity forms of the indian tradition um which i was very fascinated by as an artist um at first it was very confusing to me um what are what are what are, what are the, you know i i wondered like you know what are what are these arms um, what are all these arms what are the implements these weapons the gods and the goddesses and what does it mean you know what is what is the purpose of of what are the what's the purpose of these these forms so being naturally curious and investigative as an investigative uh, person you know um I just sort of I search for answers and I've never been satisfied I've never been someone who's satisfied with blurry ideas um or superficial understanding so I I I went quite deep um and I just sort of followed this golden thread if you will 
Um, and I, you know, I began to understand that Indian art is a language. Uh, it's, uh, it's a visual code uh, with a very particular uh, grammar. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very, uh, and it also, it's something that's been preserved through the ages and it's something that uh, is learned uh, in a very specific manner. Um, so this led me to travel throughout India and Nepal uh, learning from traditional artists. Um, and it eventually brought me to the Mayonic tradition, uh, Mayonic science and technology, uh, also known as the Vastu tradition uh, okay. and the Vishvakarma tradition. And um, to train under the tutelage of Vastu Ratna, Dr. Jesse Mercer. Uh, in the lineage of uh, Dr. V. Ganapati. So, okay. Yeah, so that, that's, that's how I ended up here, I guess. Um, I could say too that, you know, my approach has been quite different. I mean, a lot of Western artists have, have been inspired, of course, by the Indian tradition. I'm not the first one. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I um, you know, I wasn't, uh, a lot of these artists have sort of uh, synthesized aspects of a foreign culture into pre existing artistic identities. Uh, my approach mm -hmm. in, in that sense and my interest was quite different um, because I wasn't looking to import anything into my Western framework uh, and I didn't want to impose any of my own ideas either. My interest was really in a kind of total reprogramming <laughs> uh, because I'd recognized that the, a lot of the ideas that uh, I'd been holding on to were, um, were problematic in a sense. And so I really wanted to understand and to practice uh, traditional Indian art authentically um, within its own context uh, because I'd recognized mm -hmm. really that there was a very profound wisdom uh, in this tradition that, that wasn't present in the contemporary art discourse that I had been um, exposed to. You know, so, it's very interesting you should say that because from whatever little I have understood of Western art or how the West perceives art, particularly contemporary art and uh, Indian art, is that the biggest difference is that uh, contemporary art in the Western context is perceived as just the creative expression of an individual artist. It stops there. It's not a, a means to a greater end. It's an end in itself. I mean, you create an artwork, you create an installation, and that is it. The installation is the work of art. It does not stand. It is not a symbol for any metaphysical thought, or it's not a symbol for any not metaphysical, but it's not. Uh, it's not a pathway to any any spiritual thought or philosophy. At least, uh, as far as I can understand, maybe I'm wrong. But all art in India, it doesn't matter whether it is religious art in the conventional sense, like the temple architecture or the temple murtis, but even the so-called secular art, like weaving or like uh, like utilitarian objects or jewelry, whatever, even that is done as an offering to the divine. In that sense, work is truly viewed as worship. So what is your take on this? Did you feel this difference? Did you, is that... Uh, how you perceive uh, Western art versus Indian art, or rather the way the West perceives art and India perceives art? Yeah, it's a, it's a really clear distinction that you've made, an important distinction. And it, you're right, contemporary art is generally understood as an expression uh, of, of an individual artist. Um, it, it ha in, a, in a sense that has to do with where the, identific where the identification of the self lies. Uh, it really, in, in Western culture, it often lies within the body rather than anything, anything higher. Um, of course, this view is entirely opposed, like you said, to the Indian understanding of art, which is that the, the surrender of the personal ego to the wisdom of tradition is really the starting point uh, of, 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 a, of an art practice. I think, you know, in ancient times, life, uh, and still in India, that life revolved around the sacred, around nature, which was held to be sacred. And um, artists were motivated by the divine to produce the divine uh, for the divine. Um, and there is this gap, as you said, I mean, industrialization, it seems to have brought humankind into really a direct um, conflict in a sense with nature and with our own spiritual nature, which mm -hmm. in a sense we've become increasingly alienated from and we can see the results of this disconnect uh, or, or, you know, or, all around us actually. Um, and the reverence that was once accorded to nature uh, and to the sacred, um, at some point it, it shifted to a worship of the individual uh, and contemporary art, it does reflect that. Um, the thing is that when we put the individual in the center and we throw out any notion of a higher power, there are all sorts mm -hmm. of problems, 
all sorts of problems that arise because uh, it leads us in the direction of separation uh, and away from unity. Um, and what I began to realize is that this gap that you talk about, um, this separation, in a sense, it's it's like um, in a sense, it's like a wound. And uh, you know, it, it, to speak, you know, uh, personally, uh, that a bridge that I've a bridge that has healed or began to heal this divide within myself is the practice of meditation, um, because meditation okay. has provided like a direct experience uh, with the, you know with a universal creative force um, that is beyond my personality structure, um, you know, but it emerges from me, but it's not of my doing. So through meditation, um, I have realized that that this that creativity is really a universal power that uh, that as artists we have the privilege of partaking in, and in this sense, like you say, it's a sacred it's a sacred gift. But, you I mean, know, it, I have yeah. Please continue. Sorry, sorry. Please, please continue. I, I might add to this idea of you know this gap between the understandings is that um, that many people today think of this as quite naive in a way like that it, because it's not modern, uh, it's not rational. Um, but to, and traditional art is definitely seen today uh, in the contemporary context as kind of a relic of the past, as something to be uh, hmm. something that's boxed or put away in a museum, you know, as a representative, you know, in a way of a bygone era. <laughs> and um, so this ga this gap that you mentioned between the ancient and the modern is really something I'm actively uh, attempting, passionately attempting to unite because, you know, I believe that these traditions um, and particularly the Indian tradition has very uh, has a very, um, uh, it has a supreme relevance for the present is my, is my feeling. And, you know, and I, and I think also that the stakes are high. <laughs> the stakes are high because if we're to survive, uh, you know, as a species and not just, you know, survive on a basic fundamental level, but to thrive and really, you know, have an uplifting society uh, that I, I think it begins with, with reevaluating uh, the sacred within ourselves uh, and, and also within our art, you know. That's actually very profound. And that is something that I've encountered with all ancient cultures. I used to live in the United States for some time. And at that point of time, we had gone to New Mexico and we'd gone to a ancient American Indian Pueblo. And there was this very old lady. She was weaving a rug. And we started talking. And she actually told me that the warp and the weft, they represent the sky and the earth. And that is how they intertwine and that is how life is created. So that is why the weaving of that drug is like the primordial act of creation. So this kind of being connected to the universe, this kind of being connected to the to life around us, to this kind of connection with all sentient beings is something that was very, uh, very, very intuitive to all ancient cultures, I feel. I've seen that in Peru as well when I visited the Indians who wove that. So in Indian thought also, in Indian art uh, thought also that that uh, that paradigm is very much there and what I find most amazing is that you've managed to get it very easily I have read uh, your uh, your your little uh, write-up about your Hanuman Murti <coughs> where you talked about ornamentation and you have actually talked about how ornamentation is not just physical ornamentation but as always it is something that stands for a greater idea it is it is the manifest ornament that stands for a greater unmanifest idea could you talk a little bit about that because that is one thing you know uh, the western uh, people trained in the western tradition they don't understand why indian gods or indian murtis have so many ornaments Oh, it's interesting. Well, you know, everything in the, in the Murti, everything in the representation, it somehow leads us in the direction of uh, of the divine. And every every detail, every element is is there. I mean, there there are there are certain elements that that exist on on the on the sort of the immediately obvious level of, of the artwork, like the ornamentation, the implements, the form. Um, and all, all those have very particular meanings. I mean, the, the ornamentation there is, it's like, um, it's a way of, of adorning the figure and, and uh, showing our reverence for, for, for this principle. Um, and the figure really is, uh, it embodies a principle. And this is one of the key differences between the Western and the, and the Indian understanding of art is that the, these figures embody uh, principles that relate to the operation of consciousness and the manner uh, 
the manner in which uh, consciousness transforms itself from an unmanifest to a man un manifest state. And so yeah. these implements, the, the jewelry and the, 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 the weapons, they're there to indicate uh, the state of the deity, but also to activate that state within, within ourselves uh, as the viewer. Oh, which brings me to my next question. With mm -hmm. your training in contemporary arts and all the preconceived notions that come with it, and when you look at statues of, say, Roman gods or Greek gods created by the great masters in Italy or anywhere else, and if you look at, if you compare them with the murtis of Indian divinities created by traditional stapatis, what are the biggest differences that you see as a trained sculptor? I'm just asking from a purely uh, technical point of view. Yeah, well, I, I um, well, perhaps before we look at the differences, we can also acknowledge that um, similarities. Uh, yes, yeah, there are similarities. Like, for example, you know, we see that many of the implements that are held by that by these forms, they're held also by the by the Greek and Roman gods. For example, oh, they seem to be derived from the Indian tradition. For example, Zeus uh, holds Carries the light. a trident. Yes. Yeah, he holds a the light, light bulb. Yes. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yes. Like and Indra. Like, yes. Exactly, the Vajra of Indra. And um, so I do believe the roots of these, these forms lie in the Vishwakarma uh, tradition. Um, but yeah, I was listening to your introduction last night and it's interesting what you said about the, the figure because um, it's true that I think the most obvious difference uh, is the manner in which the figure is portrayed. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, the work of the European sculptors, every, every, there is an emphasis on, on anatomy um, and every level of the detail there is is present. Every sinew is is, you know, every muscle, every every tendon is there, um, and it's really represented in an exquisite detail. In in in, in you know in, in this in this artwork that you're referring to, the European masters. Um, but in the Indian tradition, this level of detail is just not present. Not because the sculptors can't do that. You know, it's just because it's not uh, it's not it's not relevant, and it's not only uh, relevant. In fact, if it was there, it would it would be a distraction in a sense from the intended function of the artwork um, because they're really not meant to be human forms. As I said, mm. they're, they're operations of the manner of the manner in which consciousness operates. And um, and they're only human like because we need human bodies to we need a because we're in a human body. We, we, we have these human bodies that we use uh, to, re to relate to. Um, but you know, if there were muscles and bones, it would focus our attention on the gross level of reality. And the art of the Indian tradition, the, the, the architecture of the Indian tradition is, is always uh, leading us towards uh, a very subtle state. Um, and, um, and that's what's intended to be enlivened um, within us. So, yeah. So no. I, I always wondered, this is probably a frivolous question, that if an Indian stapati had to say do David, how would they interpret it? I'm asking this question to you because I think you're probably the best person to, to actually answer this. <laughs> well, there are specific rules to follow uh, in the tradition in terms of how the figure is represented and, and what, the, what the proportions of the figure would be. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly there is a difference between the deity forms and the forms of, of, of siddhas and, and saints mm -hmm. in the sense mm -hmm. you fall into that category of a human form. Yeah. Also, human forms are yeah. also given sculptural form. Yes, yes. But um, yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's an incredible artwork, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting speculation to, to, to consider. Yeah. What, what, it's an interesting possibility. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thanks so much. My next question is actually you have created exquisite murtis of Matsyendranath and Hanumana and I've seen them and I've been very, very uh, moved by the, the, the expression on the faces as well as the artistic representation. I want you to talk a little bit about the fundamental transformation that you underwent, like every Indian stapati is supposed to undergo, the dhyana mantras, understanding the scriptures and creating something like that. So could you could you lead us through a little bit of that process? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, Dr. Viganapati Stapati, he, he, was, uh, he, he used the expression, a, a beautiful expression, that the sculptor uh, becomes the sculpted. And um, mm -hmm. 
you know, in other words, the artwork is like, uh, it's, it becomes an extension of the artists in a state. And um, the artwork is also, uh, it's a process of, of um, the artwork is like a process of ch chiseling and polishing oneself, um, which it's true, you know, in, the, in, the, in, in making art, the, um, it's as much as uh, about internal growth as it is about the growth of some uh, external form. Yeah. And, um, you know, every step of the way uh, in an artistic process and, and every problem that arises uh, is, in a sense, it's an opportunity to, to, to evolve. Um, Say, so yeah, the, the sculpture, the sculpture of Matsyendranath, and uh, that arose from my experience with the Hatha Yoga tradition, um, which Matsyendranath is said to have formulated. And I, you know, I went through a deep process of introspection and research for that artwork and looking at various textual sources, the visual sources um, to bring his, his light to life and also to bring his enlightened nature into the artwork, which is obviously the, the goal of, of creating a mufti like that. Um, yeah, it's, yes. it's an incredible journey to, to create uh, work like that because it's really, uh, it's a, really a matter of moving out of the way completely uh, and allowing, mm -hmm allowing the figure to really to, to, to come through because in the end what we want really is a, is a sort of a the, the artwork is intended to function in, in a sense like um, like a, a, a mirror of our own enlightened nature and a bridge um, to, 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 to bring us to, to that state. Um, so yeah there were it was, it was a, it was a deep process of, uh, of, of learning too you know like with, with, with any artwork and um, yeah, there there are many um, th there are there are many different principles to, to follow that that I was in the process of learning that I learned as I created that artwork too, um, mm. and not only on the superficial level of the artwork <clears throat> that you can see, but also uh, there there is such um, there is the principle, of course, in the Indian tradition of of, of tala and ayadi, mm -hmm. and these are very yeah. they're very important very important and very unique too. I mean, it's extremely sophisticated that the Indian tradition is, it's just incredibly sophisticated and, um, and beautiful, so. Thank you. Yesterday, in fact, there was a very beautiful presentation about the science behind uh, Hindu architecture. And uh, the lady who presented uh, talked a lot about the Talamana system and how it started and, you know, how, how, or how, how minute these measurements were and how accurate they are even in today's context it's uh, very very fascinating actually now my question to you is that when you do contemporary art now as compared to when you did contemporary art before before you were acquainted with the indian traditions uh, how do you see yourself now doing contemporary art do you see that your training or your inner transformation after having undergone training in the traditional Indian system has it changed the way you see contemporary art now and is it reflected in the work that you do yeah that's interesting it's really it's a very interesting question uh contemporary art in in a sense I have the hope that in some way that there might be within you know the the consciousness of humanity and and within within also the contemporary art world the acknowledgement that there are certain there are certain uh flaws in 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 the understanding of the way art is perceived and the way the artist is perceived and and that in a sense that these these ancient uh, traditions uh, have a lot to offer in terms of um sort of helping us to learn again uh, how art is was really practiced you know et eternally um but yeah i mean you know at a certain at a certain point in my own process i sort of just lost tolerance with anything anything uh superficial you know um i tasted this sort of uh this sort of nectar you know of of of, of being and i recognized really that the, that the real journey of life uh is is knowing this this source, you know, and experiencing it, uh, living it, and being it, you know, and um, and creating creating art from that place, and uh, and guiding others there too, you know. And so I began to see art, uh, you know, as a way of providing access to that um, to that great mystery. 
in a sense, you know, and as a way, of, as it also a means to self-realization. I mean, that's something that's really not considered in, in, in the contemporary art context. So, yeah, and it's true. That's that actually, it, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that's that's very profound, and that that is the basic uh, premise. Uh, you use the word self realization. I think that is basically the the premise behind all Indian art. Eventually, it is supposed to lead you into a journey within you. It is supposed to lead you to self realization. That was a perfect choice of words. Yeah. Uh, yeah, your your yeah yeah. Please continue. I, I would just say also that you know the the, the purpose of these art forms and manic science is really that to align. It's like it's a process of aligning the creativity of the individual with the universal process of creation, mm-hmm. uh, and it, through the five arts in India, which is so it's just so amazing, you know that these in this process the qualities uh, of, of of the infinite unbounded source of life is is brought uh, it's brought into the world, you know, and, and this is this is amazing thing, and and you know in a very in a very practical sense, um, it's like this is the creation of, of a heaven on earth, you know, and you know, I don't know what higher mission there is in life, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's very profound. In fact, your mission statement, if I remember correctly, is that as a sculptor, you use structural form to share sacred teachings using contemporary technology. And I think that basically sums up what you're doing. I really, really appreciate you coming here and spending this time. And I hope you'll stay on for the next few sessions. I have to end here because uh, we are kind of uh, bound by time. But uh, it's really fascinating, your journey and your inner transformation. And I wish you all the best. And thank you so much for coming here. And I wish you all the best for your future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shivali. Thank you. Namaste. 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 Thank you so much.